Hi, everyone. Welcome to Liquid, San Francisco's literary festival. I'm Jack Bulware, the co-founder of Liquid, and our festival runs from October 7th through the 23rd, live, virtual, recorded, indoors, outdoors. You can catch all the details right here at liquid.org. Today, we are honored to be able to present a virtual event live, Europe in Turmoil, Historical Fiction from World War II with Norwegian author Shell Ulla Dahl, German author Ulla Lenta, and moderator David Corbett. Through the miracle of Zoom, we are all live today from Norway, Germany, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Many thanks to everybody for watching today. This event is sponsored by Center for the Art of Translation and co-presented by our partners, the Goethe Institute, San Francisco. Today, we celebrate these two authors and their latest works of fiction set in the pre-World War II tensions of Oslo, Manhattan, and South America. Throughout the world in the late 1930s with war on the horizon, some countries were already occupied while others were swarming with spies, a terrain rich for fiction to say the very least. One of the fathers of the Nordic noir genre, Shel Ola Dahl has published 11 novels in 14 countries, the most prominent of which is a series of police procedurals psychological thrillers entitled The Oslo Detectives. He has received many awards and prizes, and his newest translated work is The Assistant, published by Orenda Books, based in London. He is speaking to us from outside Oslo, Norway. Ulla Lenzi was born in Germany in 1973 and studied music and philosophy at the University of Cologne, she has been writer in residence in Damascus, Istanbul, Mumbai, and Venice. In 2016, she received the Literature Prize of the Cultural Committee of German Business. Her first novel available in English is The Radio Operator, published by Harper Via, which received the Lower Rhine Literature Prize. She visits us today from her home in Germany, just outside Berlin. And finally, moderator David Corbett is the author of six critically acclaimed novels, including The Devil's Redhead, Done for a Dime, Blood of Paradise, and most recently, The Long Lost Love Letters of Doc Holliday. His nonfiction has appeared in Writer's Digest, The New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, and numerous other venues. A few things quickly before we begin. Don't forget to follow Liquid on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. You can also support all of the authors today by buying their books, either through an independent bookstore, or you can go to Liquid's bookshelf at bookshop.org. We also ask for your support of the Liquid organization. We are a nonprofit based in San Francisco, one of the most expensive cities on the planet. And um, it's, a, it's a precarious time for artists who live here. And so uh, if you believe in keeping literature a key component, of the landscape of San Francisco, please consider dropping us a few coins. Every bit helps. We accept uh, donations through Venmo or PayPal, or you can go right to liquwake.org. So um, we will have about 45 minutes of conversation, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. And uh, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So without any further delay, let's get on with our program. Please welcome Shell Ula. Ula and David. Thank you very much, Jack. That's great. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Ula Lenzi because she wins the award for being up the latest. Uh, she's uh, outside of Berlin right now and um, out in the country, I guess. And this book, The Radio Operator, has a really fascinating provenance. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about where this book came from? Yes, um, actually, uh, it came to me through my mother. Um, my mother gave me like five years ago, uh, some letters, like 180 letters, the correspondence between my great uncle, Joseph Klein and my grandpa, Karl Klein, the two brothers. And this started um, my interest in the story of Joseph Klein. The radio operator is a fictional, fictionalized version of this Joseph Klein. He was a as a young man, he went from Düsseldorf, a city in Germany, to New York. And, uh, but he didn't live the American dream. He lived a very average and simple life. And, uh, but one of his hobbies was um, um, the shortwave radio. Like he was a radio ham. 
and he connected with, with the entire world through that. And through through this, the secret service of the Nazis they uh, they got aware of him and recruited him. So this is the story. But the thing was. Um, in my family, we didn't know all these details at all. We just knew that this great uncle was somehow involved with the Nazis. I don't even think we knew this. We just knew he was in jail. And then he was detained at Ellis Island. And then he was actually deported to Germany in 1949, four years after the war had ended already. And he lived with my mother's family for a while. And she was a kid. She was 11 years old. And she has like really very vivid and precise memories of that time and of this, this, this man. And so she kept telling me about him and um, slowly I, I got this, this feeling I need to write about this person, a man who had actually three names, three identities. He started as Josef, then he became Joe. And later on when he went to South America, he was Don Jose. And this really intrigued me was this man with actually three names and um, as I said a very average person but he was like involved with like world history and at that time I mean you easily could get involved with world history. Well something that you've said about the letters themselves that he has had a rather cosmopolitan and, and even humorous nature uh, to him and what fascinated mm -hmm. you is this this man did not seem to you to be the kind of person Mm -hmm. that would team up with the Nazis. And that became for you sort of the germ of, I, that's the, the, the sort of character issue that I really needed to flesh out. Is, do I have that right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, we have these stereotypes. We think like, um, I mean, the media or the films, the movies, they present the Nazis as the very brutal guys, which they certainly were. But there were a lot of people who were just average, like Josef, and they went along, they were followers. And this Josef, as you said, he was um, he was a very friendly and cheerful guy and very relaxed and he loved jazz music and he loved actually, um, he was very world open and um, he loved New York, he really did. <laughs> Thing mm -hmm. is, at one point he, 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 um, he was just um, forging his own passport and he just said he was born in New York, which wasn't true at all, but so much he did <laughs> identify with being an American in the end. So he wasn't like the typical German or, at, or even German Nazi. He was, at, he was a very interesting example of being between the cultures and in a, in a way like, I don't know, um, maybe because he was so very open, he missed the moment where he should have distanced himself clearly from, from the criminal regime, for the, from the criminal Nazis. Well, it's a, it's a classic trope, not just in espionage fiction, but in, 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 in fiction, you know, writ large, uh, from Graham Greene to Joseph Conrad, you know, the ordinary individual who suddenly finds himself confronted with extraordinary events mm -hmm. and lacks the character, at least at the beginning of the story, to realize what he's being drawn into. And then once he's drawn in, figuring out a way to escape. I mean, it's a classic set up and, and you've done it brilliantly. And in particular, one of the things I love about the book is much of it takes place once he gets back to Germany and he's living with his brother. And the relationship between the brothers is so beautifully drawn. Thank you. Um, because that estrangement, you know, they've been, they haven't seen each other. And the way you describe uh, the, the brother who had to remain behind because of an eye injury. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned how if he had actually tried to emigrate after that, they would have marked his shoulder with an X at mm -hmm. Ellis Island and sent him back. And then just a few pages later, you mentioned that that brother Carl puts his hand on Joseph's back and Joseph says he feels like he's been marked. <laughs> There's little touches like that throughout the book. I mean, it's, it's, I, the theme is, is something that's easy to talk about. But one thing I really want to convey to the people watching, this is a beautifully written book. And the people are described exquisitely. I think you capture New York in the 30s as well as I've, I've seen it. But it's also you have a great economy in how you do that. And one of the things I, I also loved is you probably understand the German-American Bund mm. and its connection to Father Coughlin, who as an Irish-American, I know only too well, sadly. And uh, that connection to also the, the America First movement with Charles Lindbergh, you, you understand that probably better than most Americans do. 
And you, you read okay. it really well. Thanks. Um, would you Thank like you. To, would you like to read uh, a little bit from it? And, all uh, right. Yes. Yes. Um, actually, I did all the research thanks to publications in America and in Germany. We don't know anything about the subject at all so far, <laughs> but let's maybe talk about that later. I'm reading uh, from the 11th chapter. It's right in the middle of the novel, New York, February 1939. Um, it's, it's the first um, a confrontation of Josef with, with the Nazi spy gang, but he doesn't know at that point. At the last minute, he stepped out of the way of a woman leaving the Bremen house, laughing as she turned to the person with her. The fur collar of her coat brushed against his cheek. No one noticed but him. Clown noses and masks in the window of this place. It was Fat Tuesday. He found Schmüderich outside the Schaller and Weber, Weber butcher's shop. He was again wearing the military uniform, uniform of the German American Bund. The eyes in his chubby cheeked face were narrow and bleary from lack of sleep. He held one hand out to shake Joseph's and clapped him on the shoulder with the other. Let them do the talking, all right? The air in the old Heidelberg was stale and overheated. It smelled of pot roast, beer and cigars. Someone had thrown streamers onto the red checked tablecloths. They wound around the vases, which held little swastika flags. A small band played German carnival songs. For carnival comes only once a year, carnival on the right. Schmüderich pointed to a table way in the back. The men broke off their discussions and leaned back, but none of them stood up. An elegantly dressed gentleman with brill brill brilliant, sorry, brilliant tinted hair said mockingly, good heavens, Schmüderich, you really dressed to the hilt, didn't you? Now I feel like Hitler wearing a raincoat when he met Mussolini. Schmüderich laughed, but the man cut him off with a hand gesture. This guy here, this is the one with the radio. Schmüderich made introductions. The man's name was Dr. Ritter. He was in the textile business. The third man at the table was a normal looking guy, blonde, big boned, baby faced. Max has just arrived from Hamburg, but he lived in New York for a few years. He is also a radio hobbyist, said Dr. Ritter, looking at Josef with interest. Dr. Ritter talked about his Grand Hotel in Times Square, the Taft Old World, you know, and about the luxury cabin on his ship. Whenever someone else was speaking, he drummed softly on the table with his fingers. Josef wasn't part of the conversation. He waited for the food, and when it came, he awkwardly said about eating a stuffed cabbage, like someone who was seated at the table, table quite by accident and wasn't actually one of the party. The words cleaning house had been uttered. They were talking about Germany. The words sat there on the table between the bread basket and the swastikas. He wondered if he could just take off without anyone noticing. If these were the business people who needed a radio operator, it would hardly be an improvement on his old job. Just then, Dr. Ritter said, Herr Klein, what is your opinion of the New York melting pot? I don't think I have an opinion of it, he said cautiously. Oh, I know Josef Schmüderich jumped in. He likes it here. Every day he gets to feel like he's on a trip around the world. Laughter. But Dr. Ritter grew serious again. He had been walking around on the Lower East Side, he said, and he could hardly believe how backward life there was. In this day and age, a pure slum in the middle of a global metropolis, as if the poorest regions of Eastern Europe had just been dumped there, every one of them a criminal. It was high time the city started to fight back. Where did he live? In Harlem? He always said it as if he was asking a question. Most people, most people's faces went blank when they heard it, tight-lipped, especially women. You probably can't find space anywhere else. Is, is that it? I mean, the city is bursting at the seams, especially with all the refugees from Europe. Josef loosened his tie and said nothing. And the rioting in Harlem doesn't bother you, Herr Klein? Well, nowadays, there's rioting all over the place. 
He's right about that, Schmüderich jumped in again. Even at Madison Square Garden, we had to hear insults from the anti-fascists. Right, Joseph? They called you a bloody bastard. Joseph was less and less happy where, with where the conversation was going. I like living there. Good food, pretty women, and the best jests in the world. A derisive smile in the corner of Dr. Ritter's mouth. Max seemed satisfied. They were competing against each other, Josef realized. Snow was falling outside. When the door opened, he could see each individual snowflake lit up brightly in the glow of the street lamp. Washington next week, then Chicago, meetings everywhere. The firm was expanding at breakneck pace. Tell us a bit more about your radio equipment, Dr. Ritter said. Josef placed the photo on the table. He didn't show it to women anymore. They imagined nights being left sitting alone on the couch while squeals and strange voices floated through the room. He had never been able to get a woman to share in his excitement at how small the world truly was. The man, however, saw the picture and started asking questions. Yes, of course, he knew Morse code. And yes, he could also transmit speech, headphones, microphone, he had everything. He played it cool, enjoying the intention and the fact that he was finally in a position to answer questions to their satisfaction. He spoke at length of making single layer solenoidal coils and electrical loads with the variable resistors. He confirmed that it was possible to transmit as far as Hamburg and to receive signals from there. This would speed up the firm's communications enormously, Herr Dr. Ritter, said Schmüderich assiduously. But he didn't tell them the most important thing, what it was like to listen at night to the crackle and static as he carefully turned the turning knob, to send out a signal and wait for someone to respond, someone in Toronto, Helsinki or Cairo. He was just a call sign and a voice. They were all just call signs and voices. That, well, thank you for confirming for exactly what I said about your book. I mean, that is this beautifully written. And what I what really got me as I was hearing it is your the theme so much of an ordinary man being, you know, what would have caused him to be brought into this group. And you touch upon some of it there. There's the, a sort of element of 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 shame, of of not being perhaps who he should be. And then giving him an element of pride, getting him to show off his expertise, so that shame can be el eliminated. But they're sort of, at first, they're sort of going, "This is the this is the radio operator," and it, they sort of diminish him. But then they give him a chance, and that's so key to the recruitment into some of these groups. That has so much to do with sort of the ability both to tear down and build up the individual's identity. I thought you did it really well throughout the book. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Um... Well, um, uh, I mean, the interesting thing about this spy scene at that time is that it was so far from James Bond. <laughs> it was uh, rather in the beginnings and, and primitive, but I think the psych psychological aspect um, must have been quite the same. Um, and I, I read a few books on that, actually. Um, so, but um, as I said, um, they really used like amateurs like like him I, I found that really fascinating it was because of that huge distance between europe and america they couldn't just train people and send there but they had to like find people over there and they had to recruit others and that's how it went and so um i, I was fascinated to read or research about it and as i said earlier i didn't find any publications in germany on that subject though it oh. should be it, it's it's of interest of course i mean the, the german secret service what what they did in the us well, I, but, I, uh, I i think you're catching at exactly the right time because both mm. germany you know it is of course having its right-wing resurgence uh, we're certainly having a major problem with this here and the whole notion of how people can be drawn into violent and hateful groups is yeah. something i think all of us feel very much of the moment 
Absolutely, the populism is like, like spreading in Europe and abroad. It's um, it's a big issue and problem, and that's why I felt um, also the need to write this book, also to look back and see what was it like in those times. How did people get entangled? So mm -hmm. that that was actually the main drive of the book, also oh. one of the main drives. Yeah, I'm going to turn now to um, uh, Shell Uladal. Shell, if uh, you're with us, yes, oh, there he is. <laughs> Outside now, I I I I am I tend to call it Uslu, not Oslo. Is that more closer to the proper? That's right. Like That's I said, right. I had a crash course in Norwegian vowels uh, before this with from my wife. Um, your book, The Assistant, is I think only your second standalone translated yeah. into English. It's translated. Um, yes. Yes. The, the first one is The Courier. Is that correct? Yes. And they both deal with World War II. And I, obviously, uh, both of you today, you know, deal with World War II, and it's a, a topic which seemingly we can't get enough of. But I think it has a particular, from my understanding of of my Norwegian relatives, has a particularly poignant aspect in Norway. It's something that um, has affected the country deeply because they were occupied. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, you, I got that very much from this because the, the events in this book take place in 1938, just as the Nazis are making their inroads there. And what was it about in particular that not the occupation, but the preoccupation that you found fascinating? Yes, I started uh, doing research on the Spanish Civil War because uh, a lot of uh, Norwegian volunteered for the international brigades. And in that research, I found um, uh, one thing that uh, was not very well known in Norway. And that is uh, that in uh, early thirties, uh, there was a German communist. Uh, he flew, uh, he escaped from uh, Hitler Germany. And he was you know, some, a couple of years in, in, uh, in Moscow with Stalin. And then he came to Norway and he, he was married to a Norwegian woman. And when he was in Norway, he organized a group. And uh, what they did was, uh, this group was um, consisted of uh, sailors and stevedores. And, and they did attack uh, German in, and Italian ships, civilian ships with bombs because uh, Germany and Italy supported the fascists in Spain. And, um, the Germans, they, they claimed this was terrorism. And um, of course it was, but uh, you know, language and who wins the war, etc. And I think one reason that uh, uh, this topic is not very well known in Norway is that this group, this terrorist group, um, uh, in, in, during the occupation, they became <clears throat> a very important part of the resistance movement. In fact, they were the only one that uh, in the early years of the occupation uh, did uh, armed attack against uh, the Germans in Norway. So they now, became is heroes. Is this the Milorg, and I'll maybe mispronounce it, but Milorg resistance? Was that a unified thing or was that only part of it? It was a part of it, it was a, uh, yes. But so I fictional, fictionalized this. So this, uh, this historical person, he became later one minister in, uh, in Eastern Germany. He, his, na his name was Ernst Wollweber. And, uh, but I, I gave him another name and I make up this story in Norway because I, I like to stage, you know, um, uh, stories and I like to, to get to know my characters. So, uh, so, so that's, that's why I make them fictional. And um, when, I when I made this story, I wanted my characters to have a history. Uh, I, I always want that because when I think <laughs> when, when, when people react and do things, they do it out of their personality, but also of their history, the history they have. So I wanted them to have a part of history by them all, by their own, and some part that they shared. So I gave another layer, time of layer in this book uh, some years earlier in the twenties during prohibition. So these characters, they they uh, they know each other in the twenties, and then something happens in the thirties, and they meet again. 
Uh, I, I have to admit, I did not know that prohibition spread to Europe until I read your book. I, I thought that was a strictly <laughs> American phenomenon, and it kind of blew me away that you had the same. same yes, I mean, everything is connected, you know. I, I, it's the same reasons there, but we didn't have that that very violent uh, gangster communities, but there was gangsters, and and um, I mean. It, in in the twenties, there was a lot of redundancy. People were poor, and and uh, there was one way to to make big money was uh, selling illegal liquor. Yes, oh, I remember when we uh, we we toured the the back country in Norway. Um, we uh, my wife's family lives around Bergen, and we traveled up uh, into the apple orchard country, and uh, we wanted to buy some apple cider, and and then there was some hard cider, and and the guy said, "Well, no, that's for me." <laughs> <laughs> so, we're gonna sell it to us. You might have sold it to somebody new, but it wasn't gonna sell it to us. Um, I'm fascinated by the names in the book. First of all, one of the characters' name is Jack Rivers. Yes. Where did that come from? In uh, today, Jack is not a very common name in Norway, but uh, in the in the twenties, thirties, it was common. And uh, we have a famous actress by the name is uh, Jack. But the Rivers was because the um, there was a famous uh, architect in Oslo. He was uh, his, his name was Rivers, a uh, German. He was uh, uh, so. Um, I thought maybe I just liked the name, so I gave him the name, the Norwegian version of the German one, Rivers. Wow! Because <laughs> at first I sat there and go, wait, is this guy American? And, um, <laughs> and he has that quality. There's a, a term in. Um, in crime fiction called the sympathetic heavy. And he very much sort of falls into that category. The guy who, who could go either way with the law, yeah. but bends more toward the moral than the immoral as yeah. the story goes. And characters like that are intrinsically fascinating yeah. because they're complex, they're, they're complicated. I mean, he's, he was a, a, a rum runner, you know, in the twenties. And when we see him in the thirties, he's turned a leaf kind of. Yeah. <laughs> The fact is, I mean, I mean, go ahead. That, that, that's that's what is interesting with crime fiction, I think, because what it is about is is uh, writing or reading about people uh, facing crime in the society and and uh, how they react to crime, how they how they cope with crime. So, and uh, I think people are. are I don't think people are uh, originally bad. I think. If they uh, if they turn out to, to do bad things, uh, there's always a reason. I think they can be people can be psychopaths, of course, but most criminals I know they have been uh, done some bad choices. I mean, you do choices, and uh, so what I do when I write, I, I try to put a little pressure on my characters to see what kind of choices they make. That's uh, I find that very interesting. Well, just as with uh, Ula's book, where the relationship between the brothers was so key to what makes the book fascinating, that the relationship between Jack Rivers and his former nemesis, the police officer who now is a private investigator, uh, Ludwig Puska, mm -hmm. um, and th they're again a name. Isn't that the word for Easter? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's very strange, but uh, that's an homage to uh, my father's uncle. His name was Polska, so that's oh. why I gave him the name. <laughs> okay. Um, and the relationship between the two of them, especially at the end, which I, of course I won't give away, but um, and quite an ending. I again to recommend to everyone here who's uh, tuning in. This book has an ending that you will not believe, and um, I mean, of course you will, but it's just. Uh, I have. I was stunned by it, and um, did not see it coming in the least. And but there's the relationship between these two men. You know, the straight arrow, and you know, the, the sympathetic heavy, as it were, the, the man who's wild, perhaps, but not evil. Mm -hmm. um, that I I thought was really as much as the the other stuff going on, the espionage, um, the the backstory about the uh, the the days of prohibition. The present day story of the Nazis infiltrating, it always got back to, you know, Jack dealing with this moralistic character and whether he was going to allow him 
to pursue, because Jack begins to realize there's more to this mm -hmm. um, than meets the eye, and he refuses to let it go. And um, I just found that, um, again, the tension between the two men just constantly made me wonder, now this is gonna go somewhere, but I don't know where. And, it, and it, of course it does, it pays off rather marvelously in that regard. You brought up the past, and there was a line in this that I particularly loved. Um, and it, it sort of connects the timelines and connects the characters past. And it's when Jack says, have you ever had someone throw your past in your face? And that seems to be what, what motivates him. He realizes that there's a connection between what happened in the prohibition, what's happening now that he doesn't quite understand and he has to figure out how this happened. Yes. Have I got that right? Yes, and it's uh, as uh, one important character there is this uh, woman, this Amalia woman, because she represents uh, the past and uh, his. Uh, what if Jack has some some bones uh, in his his in his past and in his history? She represents them. So when she when she is is uh, suddenly there, uh, he meets his past again. Would you like to uh, read for the uh, the audience? Yes, I can read a little bit. It's from the 38th uh, layer of the book, uh, a little early in the book. Jack hands over his cloakroom ticket as soon as Amalia and her sitter have gone. While a female attendant searches through the line of garments, he sees the couple getting into a taxi. Jack is given his coat and hat and he leaves a coin on the counter. He goes out into Storgata and casts around for a free cab, but there are none to be seen. It's raining now. The couple have not gone far. The taxi stops at the crossroads. There's a police officer in black oilskins directing the traffic. At that moment, a taxi pulls up in front of the entrance and the couple get out. Jack asks the driver if he's free. The driver nods and Jack jumps in. The taxi with Amalia and the lame German is still waiting at the crossroads. Jack's taxi is now two cars behind. The windscreen wipers are slowly, arc slowly back and forth. The driver lights up uh, and offers cigarettes to Jack, who declines, as he has his own. He asks the driver to follow the car at the head of the queue, but at a distance. The driver rolls down the window a couple of centimeters and chuckles. One of those rides, I. Eh? Jack doesn't reply. They don't drive very far. The couple taxi stops in Kalyanskate outside Hotel Westminster. Jack pays and gets out of the car. He wants to give the couple some time, so he sticks close to the wall to avoid the rain and ends up studying the window display for various kinds of tobacco. When a car door slams ahead of him, Jack stays where he is. Only when the taxi drives off does he hurry over to the swing doors and go in. The receptionist in Hotel Westminster <clears throat> is a man in his 30s, dressed in a dinner jacket with a mustache as thin and curved as a plucked eyebrow. His hair is slicked back and as shiny as the lapels of his jacket. There are some keys hanging from a board behind him. Most are in place. Jack says that he saw an old friend of his, Amalia, come in here. Is she staying in the hotel? The recep receptionist tells him he must be mistaken. No women have come in. The only person to come in recently was, was Herr Krause. Is he Norwegian? He's German. Does he drag on one leg? I beg your pardon. Has he got a limp? Yes, but what is that to you? Jack thanks him and leaves. He stands outside and looks up towards the royal palace. So only her companion got out here. The taxi went off with Amali in it. Where did she go? Why has she suddenly reappeared in my life, he wonders. And why does it make me uneasy? <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a, another section in, in this book that I, I wanted to bring up because I thought it was just lovely. And it's about um, Puska's relationship with his daughter, Edna, and uh, how 
But what, rather than me tell it, I mean, I, I can tell you I, what, what I love about it is how she decides to communicate with him after not, she stops sending letters and says something else. But rather than me say it, I mean, why don't you describe that relationship? I think it's really quite wonderful. Yes. Um, she has, they have a problem. They have a problem in communication. Her mother is dead. And uh, uh, she's now in, uh, she went to Berlin uh, to be an artist. And, uh, but she had, she flew when, uh, the, after the Weimar Republic and uh, Hitler gained power. So she's now in Paris and uh, what she does is that she, she paints um, a watercolor and she uh, glue it on a uh, cardboard or a, a board of some kind and she cut it up in small pieces and sends the pieces to, his, to, to her father. And what he does is that he has to, to create the painting at home when, when he receives it in the post. And he has to, try, so he has to, to see what she sees in a way. And so they communicate that way. I just thought that was lovely. Uh, it's just one of my uh, favorite moments in the book. I've, and like I said, there are a lot of them, but, um, I'm thinking, where are we now? Well, you we got a little bit more time. Um, you brought up the uh, the uh, Spanish Civil War, mm -hmm. which I think for a lot of the resistance movements in Europe was kind of like a a clarion call that you know we have to you know we've got to fight here first. I know there there were Irish, um, there were Irish on both sides. There were the blue shirts who were very pro-Catholic because, of course, Ireland was basically a theocracy until the 60s. And, um, but there were also Irish on, on the, the, the side of the Republic. And how many Norwegians took part, do you know, that, that, that ultimately then came back and fought in the resistance at home? It was uh, on both sides in Norway, too. I mean, a lot of, uh, not many, but some. Uh, some guys that were profiled Nazis during uh, the occupation, they, they went to, to fight for the fascists. But uh, most uh, uh, went to fight for the international brigades on the Republican side. And that, was, that wasn't very many. It was, uh, I think in Norway, it was around 200 or 300. Mm -hmm. And they were young, young communists. Um, and what I find interesting is, is, uh, is um, uh, about the labor movement, you know, in the 30s and the 20s and the 30s, because there was uh, one part was uh, social de democratic and some, some parts were, were loyal to the Soviet Union and, and the international. And, and this, uh, this conflict is, um, is going on all the 30s after War II, you know, have the, you have the Iron Carpet and the East and the West, etc. And and uh, when uh, what was um, especially hard for the, the 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 young boys that went to fight for the brigades was that because Norway in the 30s claimed they were neutral to the Spanish Civil War. Uh, but there was pressure, you know, so uh, I think in 1937 or something, um, the, the Norwegian government said uh, it was illegal to fight in Spain. So uh, these guys, they were there, soldiers, and they were trapped. They couldn't come home because if they did, they were, they were jailed, you know. So um, they had a had a hard time and, and I find those fates of these guys are very interesting. Hmm. And, Graham, we, and during we, the uh, occupation they, they became famous, you know, famous uh, resistant guys. Yeah. Could we bring Ula in again as well, maybe have all three, three of us on screen at, at the time and um, there she is. Um, what was the most fascinating part of the research? Um, got, does, uh, uh, Sean was just talking about you know the fascination with how the labor movement you know interacted with the uh, with the freedom brigades uh, 
on the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War. When, what, once you started doing your research, because you, you, you mentioned the fact that there's very little mention of this about the, the American Nazi infiltration in German, what was the most surprising thing that you came across or the most fascinating thing? Hmm. Yeah, to be honest, um, well, there were two moments. One is, was when I um, found in the internet the FBI files of the, um, um, this Josef Kleine was part of, of that huge spiring called the Duquesne spiring. And till today, it was, it's the biggest spiring in America that ended in convictions. So um, when he went to court, um, no, the FBI um, interviewed him and uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's like 40, 50, 60, 60 pages, just his, um, his sentences, what he said. And this was so revealing. It was so interesting to, to find that all of a sudden. I mean, I did a lot of research again and again. And after a while, I found out that um, his name, I can write his name in different ways. I can write Joseph with F or PH at the end, for example. And I get different results suddenly, like some, some article in the New York Times would pop up all of a sudden. So this was, but the biggest, um, like a treasure was these FBI files with his original statements. That was, um, that was big, was really huge um, to be so close to my character because he already became like my character and all of a sudden reality comes in again. Like I find some data outside. The other moment was more a personal moment, not so much, um, that I found anything um, new. Um, I went to Ellis Island where he was detained. It was a detention center for um, foreign um, enemies for, for several years during the war. And um, I have a very ambivalent relationship to my own character in a way that of course, I um, think it did wrong things and he's guilty in a certain sense. At the same time, he's my character. and. When I came to that island, um, I suddenly felt him so strongly because he, he spent like four or five years, four years there. And it was January, it was, I was in New York, there was a lot of snow and it was quite empty, the city. And it was a very strong atmosphere. And I, I really felt my character all of a sudden. I felt how he must have felt when he was on this island. He, he was like jailed actually. And um, right in front of him, he could see the skyline of Manhattan, of, like this was his home, but he wasn't allowed to, to enter again. And so this was, was a very moving uh, moment personally on a personal le level. Um, yeah, that, that was a very intense moment during my research. One of the most poignant moments in the book, I thought, was when he has to tell his brother, the first time he tells his brother that he was in prison. And it's a, at a dinner and, and, and the, the mother is there as well. The kids are at the table. Mm. And he has to say, you know, we, we made all our own food, you know, just because we didn't want the Jews cooking for us. And Carl and his wife are stunned by it. And he says, no, you can't say that. Mm. And he says, right. no, no, you, you misunderstand. We thought they would poison us. And Carl's quiet for a second. And he goes, no, you don't, you can't say that. <laughs> And I just, that really, there was something about that that opened up both of those characters, both of the brothers for me, that was just wonderful. And it, but it was really based on, on that whole Ellis Island experience that he had to go through. Uh, absolutely. And this was actually, this situation, the scene, I worked on that a lot, actually. So I got it right, because it was very tricky uh, to write that moment. Um, yes. Uh, uh, that was, a, that was one of the scenes I put a lot of effort into, I remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but ahead. yes, it was, it was inspired actually by um, also what, um, what the staff members of, of Ellis Island, what, what they told me the stories. I think I got that story from them that the Germans were scared to take food from the Jewish cooks because I mean, they had a, certainly a good reason to poison the Germans, mm -hmm. I mean, in some sense. So that, that uh, was backed up that story that they told me that. Well, I think we've hit our, um, our, our 45 minute point. Let's see if we have any questions from people out in the audience. If not, we'll, we'll figure out something to say. Um, let's see, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat room yet. Uh, so let's just continue a little bit. Um, 
What what kind of research did you do about prohibition in Norway, Shell? That, that's, that's, uh, uh, yes, that's a little interesting because uh, that's uh, uh, in fact a family story. Because my my um, my father's father he died when I was long before I was born. So when my father was a child, so I did not know much about my my uh, father's family. So, but I knew something, and I knew that he was uh, born in a very poor mining village close to where I live now. And he, uh, at the age of thirty, was a very rich man. <laughs> So I started to research how how did he became become so wealthy? You know, he, he owned a shop, he owned a, a townhouse with a lot of um, apartments he rented out. And um, how did he get that money? And I found out uh, that his brother, my father's uncle, was a smuggler. So uh, and I I was intrigued by that, so I, I went to the prison archives and I went to the national archives and I got his story. So the Jack character is inspired by my father's uncle. <laughs> ah. and, he, and the thing, I mean, he's arrested and everything and it's my father's uncle all the way. <laughs> well, I, I, I found the details. I mean, just the, uh, the amount of, of alcohol being brought in, because it wasn't, it wasn't homemade. It, these were not homemade stills producing this. They were being brought in. Where from? From oh. Germany and Poland. And uh, they were brought, uh, brought by, by ship yeah. in, in international waters outside the Norwegian coast. So uh, my father's uncle, he had this small racer boat, you know, and he... He uh, sailed out to the ships and um, got a lot of cans with liquor. And uh, then he had to go back to Oslo. And uh, it had to be a very quick speedboat because the, the customs were there. They had also speedboats. So there was a lot of uh, racing in the Oslo fjord. Um, <laughs> real gangster like. <laughs> no, no, well, knowing the fjords, I, I, I'm, that's very cinematic. I can imagine. Uh, it was makes really, really great scenes of these speedboats going up the fjords as one of them weighted down with liquor and the other one weighted down with police officers. Yes, and I mean, the, the customs, they had this ship with cannons and they, they, they were shooting, you know, and, and a lot of smugglers died, in fact. Um, Ula, mm. uh, we talked about a little about this before we uh, we started. Oh, wait, we've got some questions. Yay! Questions. Oh, no, let, me, let me be a, a, a good... <laughs> How alive does World War II feel in Germany and Norway today? Uh, Ulla, why don't you start and then pick up a uh, shell after that? Mm. How alive does World War II feel today? Oh, 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 oh it's a big question. Um, well, interesting is that um, those who have witnessed the World War, they are like almost um, gone. Or I mean, these are, these are people are around 80 or 90 years old now. And one of them is like my mother. And uh, she has a lot of memories just lately of the World War. And for us, for the, their children, it's very, very important. It has, I mean, we, I know from my colleagues, from my friends that they do the same. They, they ask their grandparents, their parents, what was it like? Because it is such a significant time. And it, I think our, especially in Germany, what we are today is really based on that experience of this complete failure of humanity. <laughs> and I mean, this, this big, biggest crime of the 20th century of murdering more than 6 million Jews. I mean, it's, it's a big, big, big thing for, for, for Germany. And so um, it is an issue, it's a topic. And um, though, I mean, my generation is, is quite far away from it, I mean, thinking in decades, but still it's, it's very, it's, it's present, yes. And I think it's, it's important that we, we don't forget it. Sean? Sure. Yes, uh, the World War II is still a hot topic in Norway, especially um, the, uh, the latest years, it has been uh, the Norwegian Holocaust, um, because um, what was special in Norway was that um, the Norwegian Holocaust was not uh, organized by the German occupants. It was organized by the Norwegian Nazi regime. So, and um, there's always a discussion who did, uh, who, who had the responsibility. There was police, 
and what role did the resistant um, what uh, what did they do and what did they not do uh, so and and there's all there's a lot of hot discussions you know because um, the children's children they live and they want to um, they are not uh, happy when someone talk bad about uh, talk bad about their their grandparents etc so there's a lot of discussions still yes that question was from Tracy Friedman. Thanks for that, Tracy. Michael Mousy asks, can both of the authors talk about their writing practice? How often do you write? Uh, do you write at the same time every day? And how much does research factor into that writing practice? Uh, one, this time we'll start with Shell and then go back to Uri. Me first? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, uh, I write every day, um, but... Um, I am um, I'm very humble to my writing. I, I I never plan what I write. I mean, I I uh, I start in the morning and I have this four or five hours writing, and after that, my my brain is so tired. I, I do not write anymore. <laughs> um, but um, the research is very important. Uh, research is very inspiring. I mean, um, if you if you uh, if, if if I have a problem and if I don't get any further, I can I do the research and and so I see some I get inspired. Like once, for instance, I I, I had in a, one of the Oslo detectives books, I had um, uh, uh, it's called the Ice Swimmer. I had a. I wanted uh, one person to be killed in um, the subway, and I didn't understand how it was possible. So um, I, I asked uh, the subway, "Can I have a walk?" And I walked in the tunnels, and then I saw it how it happened. So uh, research is always inspiring, and especially when you do historical fiction, you can go in old maps and old. Uh, videos and old photographs and, and books and read. So it's very inspiring. Well, what's your practice like and how does the research work into it? Yeah, it's, it's very similar. Like um, I write in the mornings, preferably the, the first thing I do in the morning is read the writing and I'm, uh, I, I don't want to talk to anyone or don't even want to say good morning to anyone. <laughs> I'm very special. Like I just want to be in that space and, and um, so, and then um, after two, three or four hours, I really, I'm, I'm extremely tired and exhausted. And I spent the rest of the day maybe proofreading what I've written or um, maybe planning the next day what I need to write uh, on the next day. And the research, um, best thing is that it's completed before you start the writing. Um, that's what I noticed with my, with, with this latest novel, The Radio Operator. Um, because a few sometimes um, I, I would stumble across details and facts and had to adapt and, and that was a lot of work and <laughs> so that's frustrating. It was the first time I had to do so much research actually. Be, before I was writing novels that were from my own reality and so I felt authorized <laughs> in a natural way and I knew everything but uh, this time it was a really new way I took and uh, I really loved it. It was like ex expanding my horizon so much and uh, I will, the next novel I will do again, um, it will be a historical novel again because I, okay. I really love it. Let's follow up on that. Now, do you do research first and then write? Or did I, I, uh, a writer friend of mine says he has a four month rule that you know he'll research for four months but then he has to start writing. He'll continue researching and he writes because but he just knows that uh, mm -hmm. The way he put it, research is just a very creative form of writer's block. <laughs> that you, uh, you know, so true. That you yes. Just keep doing yes, it because true. you love doing the research and it just about it it is. you're resisting writing. So do you continue researching? It sounds like you do, that you continue researching because it continues to inspire and to give you ideas. Yeah, I enjoy it. I really enjoyed it. I could still do research on that subject if, if I had the time, if I had a million years or let's say a thousand years, I would still sit here and do the research probably and not write. <laughs> yeah, I saw you nodding. Charles, is that true of you as well? Yes, that's true. Okay. I, I continue doing research the whole time. Hmm. Uh, Deborah 
Krott says, I don't have a question, but I did want to say that I learned a lot from both of you regarding some facts in World War II that I knew nothing about. Enjoyed this a lot and we'll check out these books. Well, thank you for that, Deborah. And then we have a Kei Yin says, seconding Deborah, being from New Zealand, our World War II focus is mainly on the war in the Pacific against Japan. And in the case of the European side of the war, the battles in Crete. Thankful to hear about experiences during World War II that were missed from my own education. So seems like you guys uh, developed some new fans and, and, <laughs> and as you should, because these are really wonderful books. I, and and I'm, I'm pretty well read. And, and, and as I said, I, I learned a lot from both of them. And, but not only that, I just enjoyed them. They're really just enjoyable. And in two really distinct ways. I mean, you're really different writers but as I said, there were, there were some real connections. You both focus on how the past influences the present. And you both, both books benefit profoundly from the relationships you show between the two men. In, in, in these instances, one, the brothers, and the other two, the partners. And um, then, um, I'm, so I'm gonna ask one question. I'm always positive I know what the answer is, but did you plan that before you, you began writing? Or did that just emerge as you began writing the story? i start with Shell, because I have a feeling I know what his answer is going to be. I did not plan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought. <laughs> it emerged uh, when I'm, uh, while I was working, yes. Um, Kate Atkinson, went, I once asked her, I said, how do you develop your character? She said, with my fingers, as I'm typing. Um, and I, that, that, that's, <laughs> struck me as, yeah, that's, that's probably the most practical way to go about it. But the, no, I think the brother relationship was more central to how you began your journey because it was both your your grandfather and his brother right 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 that served as an emotional access for myself that was the closest thing that i had like that was i i um i, I knew my grandfather so i could start from there and it was something familiar and close and i knew the house in noise a small city in, in germany so um the image images came and that was important was just to have some access to the material that's how i started and um, everything else, uh, as I said, um, it was different from my other novels because um, the story was already written in some way. I couldn't make huge changes and I didn't want to. I committed myself to being true to the facts as far as I could research them. And where there were gaps, I would just um, invent, of course, like uh, there were a lot of gaps, but uh, I wanted to really tell the story of this, this person, of this Joseph Klein, that, that was um, my, my goal. Julian Barnes uh, has this wonderful line in uh, one of his recent novels, which is, history is where the lack of documentation intersects with the faultiness of memory. <laughs> and I just love that. It's because, and that's, that's where the imagination comes in, where you said, you know, I've got to fill in the blank spots. There's the things I don't know. And that's, mm -hmm. that's sort of the joy of it. That's sort of, exactly. you know, like you're saying with your character shell, you know, that's, yeah, I could base them on, on certain characters, but there's no joy in that. I'd like to create my own characters, use that as a basis and then springboard from what I understand and what I feel from, from what I need from the story. That's very true, yes. Well, listen, I think that this has been a, a great hour. It's really a pleasure to meet you. It's, um, and it's a, just a drag that none of us get to travel. Um, <laughs> Uh, but here we are, and yeah. um, it's it's so great that uh, and Ula, you managed to write your pandemic novel, and it's a wonderful book. <laughs> I know that the pandemic That's really sad. took a toll on you because you're you're really quite a traveling soul. Actually, yes, I, I was supposed to actually come to the U.S. this autumn, but we will postpone it next year. So at least I'll, I'll have a reading tour next year, probably. And thank yeah. you so much, David, for this wonderful moderation. Oh, yes, thank you. thank you, David. And it was very nice to meet you both. Mm. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, all so much for for uh, participating today. It's it's. Uh, I feel like we could really go another hour just because I, the the everyone's connecting so well, and it's a it's a fascinating subject. And uh, obviously, we had a lot of questions, and and people are commenting in the chat, and that's. That's fantastic. I urge everyone watching to please go buy their books um, through bookshop.org or your favorite independent bookstore. Let's stay away from the store 
owned by the guy who goes into space. Let's not even, we won't even bother with that. Uh, thanks also to, uh, to our sponsors and partners who helped make this possible. Um, Center for the Art of Translation, the Goethe Institute, San Francisco, and, uh, and the publishers, uh, Arpervia and Arenda Books. Um, the Liquid Festival continues through October 23rd, and we hope uh, you can all attend some more events. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.